Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on management of severe bronchial asthma in critical care. Flow diagram. Initial assessment. If the patient has mild to moderate bronchial asthma, FEV1 or PEFR more than 40%, administer short-acting beta-2 agonist by MDI or nebulizer every 20 minutes for 3 times if needed. Oral steroids should be prescribed if there is no immediate response. If the patient has severe bronchial asthma, FEV1 or PEFR of less than 40%, administer short-acting beta-2 agonist plus ipratropium by nebulizer every 20 minutes for 3 doses or continuously for 1 hour. Administer IV steroids. If the patient has life-threatening asthma, intubate and ventilate. Administer short-acting beta-2 agonist and ipratropium by nebulizer. Give IV steroids and adjunctive treatments. Admit to intensive care unit. After repeat assessment of mild to moderate or severe asthma, if the patient has satisfactory response, FEV1 or PEFR of more than 70%, and the response is sustained for 60 minutes after aerosol treatment, we can discharge the patient home. If there is incomplete response, FEV1 or PEFR 40-69%, to 69%, administer short-acting beta-2 agonist aerosol every 60 minutes for 3 doses if needed, and IV steroids. If there is poor response to treatment, FEV1 or PFR of less than 40%, give short-acting beta-2 agonist and ipratropium by nebulizer every 60 minutes or continuously, and IV steroids. Final assessment. If there is satisfactory response after treatment and the response is sustained for 60 minutes after aerosol, patient can be discharged home. If there is incomplete response, FEV1 or PFR 40 to 69%, and the PaCO2 is less than 42 mm mercury, consider admitting to the hospital. If there is poor response, FEV1 or PFR less than 40% and PaCO2 is 42 mm mercury or more, admit to ICU. FEV1 and PFR are difficult to obtain in critically ill patients. Use clinical assessment of disease severity to guide management. Clinical features of acute severe asthma Severe asthmatic attack The patient is unable to talk in full sentence. There is usage of all accessory muscles of respiration. Respiratory rate is more than 25 per minute. Heart rate more than 110 per minute. PFR 33 to 50% of predicted or of the patient's recent best effort. Pulses paradoxes is not regarded as a useful sign. ABG Initially, there is an acute respiratory alkalosis with normal oxygenation. PaCO2 is low to normal. Non and ion gap metabolic acidosis from renal compensation in a chronically hyperventilating patient can occur. In life threatening asthma, the patient is exhausted with failing respiratory effort. There might be confusion, mental obtentation, silent chest, bradycardia, and hypotension. PFR is less than 33% of predicted or less than 125 liters per minute. SpO2 is less than 92%. Cyanosis is likely. For arterial blood gases, despite hyperventilation, oxygenation declines, ventilatory muscle fatigue occurs and PaCO2 rises to normal and then increases subsequently. Lactate induced and ion gap metabolic acidosis with lactate production from fatiguing respiratory muscles direct cellular effect of aggressive beta agonist therapy and decreased liver perfusion can reduce lactate clearance. Short-acting beta-2 agonists are the preferred bronchodilators for acute exacerbation of asthma. Inhaled beta-2 agonist aerosol compared with IV beta-2 agonist therapy, inhaled beta-2 agonists are more effective and has fewer side effects. Bronchodilator effects are apparent in 2 to 3 minutes with a peak effect at 30 minutes and lasts for 2 to 5 hours. Salbutamol, also known as albuterol, is the most widely used short acting beta 2 agonist. It is a racemic mixture of two isomers, only one being active. Levosalbutamol is the active isomer of salbutamol. It is a more powerful bronchodilator than salbutamol, however, clinical studies have shown no advantages. 
Salbutamol should be delivered by inhalation at larger and more frequent dosing intervals due to decreased deposition at the site of action, increased inspiratory frequencies and flow rates, alterations in the dose response curve, and altered duration of activity. There is decreased deposition at the site of action due to low tidal volumes, narrowed airways, and 90 degree curvature of the endotracheal tube results in deposition at the endotracheal tube. To solve this, disconnect the circuit as close to the patient as possible and use either MDI plus spacer or nebulized therapy and use higher doses. Dosing regimens. For salbutamol nebulizer, 2.5 to 5 mg every 20 minutes for 3 doses or 10 to 15 mg by continuous inhalation for 1 hour using a large volume nebulizer. This is actually more effective than intermittent aerosol therapy for severe airflow obstruction. Followed by 2.5 to 10 mg every 1 to 4 hours as needed. For MDI, 4 to 8 puffs equivalent to 90 micrograms per puff every 20 minutes for up to 4 hours, then every 1 to 4 hours as needed. Use a holding chamber for inhalations. For levosalbutamol nebulizer, as for salbutamol but half the dose in intermittent doses, levosalbutamol has not been evaluated for continuous inhalation. For metered dose inhaler, as for salbutamol but half the dose, i.e. 45 micrograms per puff. Metered dose inhaler technique. A dose of 4 to 8 puffs every 20 minutes for 3 doses and then every 1 to 4 hours as required is at least equivalent in effectiveness to small volume nebulizer therapy. Studies in the emergency department suggest that the MDI method may be more effective than nebulization because the drug is delivered in shorter period of time, 1 to 2 minutes. This requires patient cooperation and proper technique. Nebulizers are preferred to MDIs for moderate to severe airflow obstruction. When the acute episode begins to resolve, salbutamol can be given by intermittent aerosol treatments of 2.5 to 10 mg every 4 to 6 hours. Adverse effects of high-dose aerosol therapy with beta-2 agonists, tachycardia, fine tremors, hyperglycemias, electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypophosphatemia, these can induce dysarrhythmias. Increased serum lactate and increased risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia in intubated ICU patients. Anticholinergic aerosols Offer only marginal benefits in acute asthma. Their use is restricted to combination therapy with short-acting beta-2 agonists for the first 3-4 to four hours of treatment in patients with moderate to severe airflow obstruction. Deposition of ipratropium enhanced when it follows salbutamol-induced bronchodilation. There is no proven benefit beyond the first few hours of treatment. This should not be used for daily maintenance therapy in asthma. It produces a clinically significant response within minutes of administration. Ipratropium bromide is a derivative of atropine and blocks muscarinic receptors in the airway. And the dose is for nebulized ipratropium, 0.5 mg every 20 minutes for 3 doses. This can be added to salbutamol or levosalbutamol nebulized solution. And then the dose is as needed. For metered dose inhaler, 8 puffs equivalent to 18 micrograms per puff every 20 minutes as needed for up to 3 hours. Use a holding chamber for inhalations. Ipratropium plus salbutamol nebulizer 3 ml 0.5 mg ipratropium plus 2.5 mg salbutamol every 20 minutes for 3 doses and then as needed. Or metered dose inhaler 8 puffs which is 18 micrograms ipratropium plus 90 micrograms salbutamol per puff every 20 minutes as needed for up to 3 hours, use a holding chamber. Side effects of ipratropium Systemic absorption of ipratropium is minimal. There is little risk of anticholinergic side effects such as tachycardia, dry mouth, blood vision, and urinary retention. Aerosol intolerance this is usually due to excessive coughing. For asthmatic patients who are at imminent risk of respiratory arrest, provide inhaled and subcutaneous administered beta agonists. Alternative regimens to aerosol treatment includes subcutaneous adrenaline 
0.3 to 0.5 mg every 20 minutes for 3 doses or subcutaneous terbutaline 0.25 mg every 20 minutes for 3 doses. Patients are more likely to tolerate aerosol treatments after bronchodilator effects of adrenaline or terbutaline. Subcutaneous beta agonist therapy has a worse therapeutic toxicity ratio when compared with inhaled beta 2 selective agonist therapy. Subcute adrenaline should be avoided in patients with cardiac disease and elderly patients. Terbutaline is the parenteral agent of choice in pregnancy. IV beta agonist therapy has no advantages over aggressive inhaled therapy and produces increased toxicity. IVI isoproteranol and terbutaline has been used in children but is not recommended in adults. Corticosteroids Not all studies show a benefit from corticosteroids in acute asthma. Potential benefits include increased rate of improvement, decreased rate of relapses, increased beta-2 receptor responsiveness, interruption of arachidonic acid inflammatory pathways, decrease in capillary basement membrane permeability, decrease in leukocyte attachment, intracellular modulation of calcium migration, decrease airway mucus production, and decrease IgE receptor binding. Relevant observations. There is no difference in efficacy between oral and IV steroids. The beneficial effects of steroids are often not apparent until 12 hours after therapy is initiated. There is no evidence that larger steroid doses produces greater responses. Steroids given as a 10-day course can be stopped abruptly without a tapering dose. Inhaled corticosteroids are added when the acute episode begins to resolve. Continue for at least a few weeks after resolution to prevent relapses. Dosing regimens for acute exacerbation of asthma. The indication for steroids is unsatisfactory bronchodilator response after one hour. Oral route is preferred. 40 to 80 mg daily in 1 to 2 divided doses using oral prednisolone or IV metoprednisolone. Duration of therapy. Continue until resolution of signs and symptoms. No taper is necessary if duration is less than 10 days. Oxygenation and ventilation. Hypoxemia in asthma is often due to a low pulmonary ventilation perfusion ratio, typically responsive to oxygen therapy. Cases of severe asthma can often be oxygenated easily with oxygen concentrations of 28 to 35%. Asthma is a primarily ventilator defect caused by bronchoconstriction, mucus plugging, increased work of breathing, air trapping with increased dead space. PaCO2 derangements are more profound and are recognized earlier than those of PaO2. Criteria for ventilatory support in severe bronchial asthma. The clinical decision is based on many factors such as clinical features, PFR, ABG, and coexisting issues. Mechanical ventilation should be initiated if there is central cyanosis, altered sensorium, pH less than 7.25, respiratory distress with normal or elevated PaCO2, and cardiopulmonary instability. For endotracheal intubation, use a technique that one is most proficient in and use the largest possible endotracheal tube to reduce autopeak. Ventilator settings depends on various factors such as the degree of ventilatory defect, degree of ventilation perfusion mismatch, and severity of air trapping. If volume control, peak inspiratory flow rates should be set at 80 to 100 liters per minute with a square waveform. This satisfies air hunger and minimizes autopeak. Air trapping generates autopeak and interferes with ventilation, oxygenation, and comfort and increases the risk of barotrauma, severe asthma exacerbations, and hospital admission. Mechanical ventilation in severe air trapping. To avoid hyperinflation from high respiratory rate from the patient-initiated breaths, provide heavy sedation, analgesia, paralytics, and assist control ventilation. Heavy sedation or paralysis, pros and cons. The pros is decreased carbon dioxide production, allows accurate pressure measurements and effective ventilation. Cons, neuromuscular blockade with or without steroid therapy increases the risk of ICU-acquired myopathy. This myopathy is more likely to occur in renal impairment, females, hypophosphatemia and concomitant steroids and should be discontinued ASAP and limit paralysis to 1 to 2 twitches to a train of force stimuli using a peripheral nerve stimulator. 
other considerations. When the response to bronchodilators after one hour has not been satisfactory, the following measures can be added to bronchodilator therapy. IV magnesium has mild bronchodilator effects, mechanism of action is calcium channel inhibition and decrease in acetylcholine release. The dose is 2 grams IV over 15 to 30 minutes. This improves lung function and reduces hospital admissions in patients who respond poorly to initial bronchodilator therapy. It produces a small but clinically significant improvement in the most severe cases of acute asthma. Repeated doses can be used in patients without renal disease, monitor for magnesium toxicity. Regarding theophylline, inhaled beta agonists are more superior. Mechanism of bronchodilation is unclear. It is an effective bronchodilator when compared with placebo. It is most effective when combined with inhaled corticosteroids in moderate asthma. It has a narrow therapeutic index, considered only when other options has been exhausted. It can cause life-threatening arrhythmias and seizures. IV loading dose is 6 mg per kg over 30 minutes. IVI maintenance dose 0.5 mg per kg per hour to achieve 8 to 10 mics per liter. Lower infusion rate in heart or liver disease. General anesthetic agents such as IVI ketamine, isoflurane and sevoflurane may be used in intractable bronchospasm. For leukotriene inhibitors, they inhibit cystinyl leukotriene receptor and decreases inflammation, bronchoconstriction and smooth muscle edema. RCTs have shown that these agents can accelerate resolution of bronchospasm when used with standard therapy. Antibiotics are not advised unless there is evidence of a treatable infection. Asthma exacerbations are often triggered by viral upper respiratory tract infections. Non-invasive ventilation are indicated for patients with severe asthma without imminent ventilatory failure. It is contraindicated in patients with altered sensorium, abdominal disease, and advanced pregnancy. It can be effective in correcting the hypercapnia and avoiding intubation and mechanical ventilation. Provide mild sedation such as Presidex to increase effectiveness of NIV. Arterial blood gases are advised for patients who show little or no clinical improvement after one hour of aggressive bronchodilator therapy. A normal PCO2 in acute asthma is evidence of respiratory failure Hypercapnia is a sign that ventilatory assistance may be needed ASAP. Heliox is a mixture of helium and oxygen with ratios of helium to oxygen being either 80 to 20, 70 to 30 or 60 to 40. It decreases turbulent flow in larger airways, increases expiratory flow, decreases dynamic hyperinflation, increases deposition of bronchodilators and decreases autopeep and it is reserved for cases of severe asthma with hypercarbia and high airway pressures. It is not yet considered a standard of care due to lack of evidence from RCTs. These are my references. Thank you.